first official concept and use of quarantine started in, uh, in Venice in the late 1300s during a big plague epidemic. And this is before the germ theory, before we knew what pathogens caused diseases. It was quite clear that human mobilities, particularly by sea, was moving the bubonic and pneumonic plague around the world through ports. And the Port of Venice set up this system, a formal system of quarantine. Quarantine comes from the uh, Italian and then Latin quarantina, meaning 40 days. They would stay out of port flying a yellow quarantine flag for 40 days until the epidemic of plague or whatever it would be would burn itself out. The concept of quarantine was used to protect healthy cities from the importation of these threats through commercial travel. As the colonies developed, epidemics spread into North America. American quarantine law dates back to the Massachusetts Bay Colony in 1647, and the quarantine has served as a cornerstone of America's public health ever since. In 1793, a yellow fever epidemic struck Philadelphia, killing 5,000 people in three months. Because of the severity of the yellow fever epidemic, Philadelphia built the first U.S. quarantine station and hospital on the Delaware River, called the Lazaretto. In 1798, President John Adams and Congress created the U.S. Marine Hospital Service. This service established a network of hospitals and quarantine staff along the coast to protect our young country against the spread of disease. Sailors and immigrants arriving from foreign ports were screened for signs of disease. Sick people were isolated and treated, and exposed people were quarantined. Eventually, this network became the U.S. Public Health Service. In 1918, the worst influenza pandemic in recorded history, also known as the Spanish flu, occurred at the end of World War I. Influenza killed nearly 700,000 people in the United States and about 50 to 100 million worldwide. As World War I was ending, cities in the United States held Liberty Loan parades to help pay for the war effort. With the flu pandemic at its peak, St. Louis decided to cancel its parade, while Philadelphia chose to continue. The next month, Philadelphia had a death toll of more than 10,000 people from the pandemic flu versus 625 flu deaths in St. Louis. This deadly example provided a great case for canceling mass gatherings during pandemic outbreaks, an important outbreak control tool. The Foreign Quarantine Service began to come into, into being through regulation and law changes in the Public Health Service Act around 1948. The concept of quarantine first and foremost originated in a commercial context. It was about protecting international commerce and the receiving communities from the benefits of that commerce. It wasn't until 1967 that it came to CDC during a great period of mergers and acquisitions. In 1969, quarantine practice went from ships to spaceships. President Richard Nixon cheers the Apollo 11 astronauts who just returned from the moon. To prevent potential cross-contamination from space, the astronauts spent 21 days quarantined inside a hermetically sealed trailer, as CDC recommended. In January 2017, CDC updated U.S. federal quarantine regulations and published the final rule for control of communicable diseases, interstate and foreign. These rules clarify CDC's authorities in controlling the importation and spread of communicable diseases into the United States and territories, and ensure CDC will seek to use the least restrictive means necessary to prevent the spread of communicable diseases. One of the challenges, it's both a challenge and a great opportunity, is to um, align and deal with um, the balance of protecting public health, protecting American communities, with balancing the civil rights of individuals. That balancing act is very, very challenging. When I told you earlier about the ethics of, of quarantines in the 14th century through, I would say, the early 20th century, it really focused on the protection of the community at the expense of the victims. The victims were seen as vectors and nothing else, not victims of, of disease. We had the emergence of the, in the last 50 years of the civil rights movement in, in the United States where the rights uh, of individuals and human rights and individual rights and rights of vulnerable populations has, has come you know, right up front and center, as it should. 
But when you think about applying the, the regulatory responsibility of, of quarantine, and our division has the largest regulatory responsibility at, at CDC, you've got to do that in a way that's commensurate with um, protecting individual rights and, and civil rights. And it's a challenge which we welcome. Today, CDC's Quarantine and Border Health Services branch maintains 20 quarantine stations to protect America's health at U.S. ports of entry, where most international travelers arrive by sea, land, and air. Disease is just a flight away. It's our job to make sure one sick traveler doesn't become 100 sick people in our communities. Quarantine and Border Health Services staff respond to sick travelers who may have contagious diseases. We connect newly arrived immigrants who have certain public health conditions with state public health authorities. We restrict the importation of animals and products that may carry disease. We alert travelers in the travel industry of disease outbreaks. We send emergency life-saving drugs to hospitals and clinics to treat patients with malaria, botulism, or diphtheria. We collaborate with federal agencies, local health officials, airlines, and cruise lines to identify sick travelers and alert other passengers of potential exposure. With a passion and expertise for safeguarding America's health from borders to our communities, we are a diverse workforce from many cultures, speaking many languages. We are scientists, doctors, nurses, veterinarians, technology and data experts, educators, communicators, and emergency responders. We responded to outbreaks of Zika, Ebola, MERS, the 2009 H1N1 flu pandemic, SARS, and cholera. We sent border health response teams to help control the Ebola epidemic in Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone because the most efficient way to protect America and other countries is by stopping the outbreak at its source. Part of the near-term future is figuring out how to build a staff that has the concurrent capacity for response and our core peace, peacetime work. To do that, I think, is, is a challenge that will, will go on. Learning from our Ebola response, our international border team helps foreign governments develop their capacity to prevent the spread of disease across borders and into our own country or other parts of the world. We are CDC's Quarantine and Border Health Services branch with a legacy of serving as a cornerstone to public health, now reinvented to serve a world where disease is just a flight away. <laughs>